All right, and welcome to the first episode of the Court Advantage Athletic Development Show. Uh, I set a goal for the show in 2022 that I wanted to have 12 giants of our industry on the show. Uh, and I couldn't be more excited today to have one of the smartest people, I think, in the history of our business, uh, Dr. Mike Young, on the show. Uh, he is so accomplished, we'd probably burn the entire podcast if I gave you his, his full resume. Uh, but he's the founder of Athletic Lab. He's the high performance manager at the um, North Carolina Courage, one of the largest, if not the largest, women's soccer programs in the world. And his history of working in private sector, universities, in education, directly training athletes, working in track and field team sports, uh, it's pretty much unparalleled. Uh, so, Mike, so happy to have you on the show. Uh, thanks for, for coming on board. Well, thank, thank you for having me. I uh, didn't realize this was your first episode. Quite an honor, and I need to, uh, if you're free, I need to hire you to uh, be my professional introduction <laughs> MC because I'm fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I should say it's my first first episode of the year, uh, and I, I've always had this thing, Mike, where where I am a little bit shy. So I've tended to reach out to uh, people that I already know because I know I'm lucky enough to know lots of smart people in in Melbourne, Australia. We have a bit of a hotbed of strength and conditioning talent. Sure, yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, getting to chat to, to you, someone who I've, I've admired from afar for a long time, is uh, is super exciting. Um, for those people, and and one of the things about you is that if if Instagram was a genuine meritocracy, you would have about 5 million followers because your stuff is brilliant. <laughs> but but you, you don't, you're, not, you're not flashing booties and, and crazy exercise. You're just doing fundamentals brilliantly. Uh, for those that don't know about you, could you just take us through sort of where it started and, and um, up to sort of where it's at these days? So you mean professionally or my Instagram account? Yeah. <laughs> professionally so yeah. I, uh, my, yeah, so my, your career yeah i was uh you know kind of a y young guy who participated in sports i ran track and field collegiately uh did a little bit of team sports here and there uh knew that i really loved i loved the whole process of training even from a really young age was kind of training myself learning and geeking out on training i you know i bought I requested sports science books and journals for, for Christmas as, as early as 13 years old. So I didn't oh, really wow. realize what I was kind of, what I was getting into it was just kind of selfishly training myself. And then, um, you know, went to school to be a, a medical doctor, uh, realized after about three years that that wasn't for me, that I was really passionate about sports science and coaching. So I shifted gears, changed majors as the case would be, and then stayed in school for another seven to eight years or so, uh, getting, mm -hmm. racking up a handful of sports science degrees in exercise physiology, coaching science, um, motor control and biomechanics. And along the way, I was also coaching. So in the U S we have this kind of process where our NCAA system works hand in hand with the university system. So you can have some of your education funded if you work with teams. So I was able to work with, uh, as an SNC coach or a track and field coach, or in one instance, both at the same time, uh, with some pretty high level athletes initially at a kind of a medium stage in the U S collegiate level division one. But then my last college that I worked at was about as good as it could possibly be LSU track and field during that time period. We won mm -hmm. six national championships in four years, highly successful, kind of the golden era of, uh, that program's highly storied, track and field history. There were Olympians all over the place and uh, from multiple countries and just highly, highly successful and exposure to true elite level performance. It was very, very eye opening, not only from the training that was done, which was tremendous and, you know, just blew my mind, really opened the doors to what was possible, but also seeing what it took on a management and logistics and administration level to have sustainable success. This is a program that had uh, upwards of 30 national championship track and field, uh, nas team national championship tra track and field uh, wins, which is largely unprecedented. There aren't too many programs, mm -hmm. regardless of sport in the United States, where teams are winning at that level for that le long. And I've always thought sustainable success is, never occurs by coincidence. So. I was just showing up to practice every day, writing down notes, uh, both in terms of the training theory, what was being done, as well as 
uh, how things were managed, and it was just tremendously eye-opening. From there, I, or actually while I was there, finishing my doctorate, working as a coach, I started a business, uh, Human Performance Consulting, later became known as Athletic Lab. We were largely a virtual company, and that's what we would call it today, uh, meaning mm -hmm. I was doing online consults and shooting some educational videos and that kind of thing, uh, ended up garnering some relatively larger contracts with national governing bodies. So we had a the largest uh, sport science and support contract with USA Track and Field in the history up until that point. Uh, we ran that for three years as if we were some major company. And really, it's just me and my buddy sitting behind our kitchen table and then bringing in a bunch of interns. And um, yeah. then... Um, Let's see, we, uh, I moved on to coach, coach full-time at uh, West Point Military Academy, which was another eye-opening experience. West Point is kind of at least dubs itself and in many, many ways internationally is even regarded as the chief leadership academy in the world. You know, many military and uh, governmental organizations send their young leaders to uh, go to school there or to mentor there or to see what they're doing there because uh, we've had so many people come out of that program that are astronauts and congressmen and presidents and Fortune 500 CEOs is just you know kind of ridiculous. So I went from a program that was super elite athletically to a program that was much less athletically elite but was elite in many other regards. You know, these are these are people that are literally going to run the world, the Western world, at least in the U.S. Uh, mm. front. And um, you know, many of the athletes that I coached are congressmen and senators and mayors of uh, major, you know, U.S. states and those kinds of things. And uh, so then I went there, coached for three years, largely went there because um, my wife wanted me to be closer to where she was from, uh, but that was in New York, and stayed there for three years, tremendously rewarding to work with such high quality individuals. But then after three years, I kind of said, hey, I need to finish my PhD. I had left my PhD studies, all but dissertation, and uh, I had done all the research, all the data collection, but I hadn't really written anything for three years. I was just piling up this consulting work and the coaching work with West Point. So then uh, I left the left West Point and went to basically start my business, just jumped jumped in uh, head first into the deep end and made it made myself swim, went to North Carolina where we currently are, sight unseen. I'd never Never been to this particular state before, uh, other than maybe flying wow. through it, and um, didn't have any contacts or anything like that. A whole convergence what, of what made you happened. choose North Carolina? That's such a that's such a brave move to just go. Just so this is an interesting one. Place. I'm a I'm a pretty calculated guy. Um, so mm. I had done all the analytics and uh, business research on where I thought my business model could work, and I had basically narrowed my search down to about. Uh, a top five, and then another second tier of five. And North Carolina yeah. was the closest of those. And my plan was that I was actually going to visit each one, take a site visit, see how I liked it, maybe check out a couple potential real estate options, and then make a final decision. Well, the funny story, and I'm sure you can appreciate this as an entrepreneur, is that it, in retrospect, you oftentimes see these things that just have this chain, you know, start a domino effect in your life. And on my drive down there, so this is about a six hour drive for those of you that are not from uh, the States, a six hour drive. I was living in Ohio for a brief period. I drove down to North Carolina, uh, intending to really just stay there for the week. And I, uh, on the way down there, I get a call from a guy who had attended a conference of mine about three years prior uh, that my company that I started as a doctoral student, Human Performance Consulting, had uh, he had attended it. And he says, hey, Mike, I'm starting a business down in Apex, North Carolina. And uh, do you know of any strength and conditioning coaches down here? 
So I say, <laughs> well, funny thing is, I'm, I'm driving down there right now. Um, I'm going to be in your area in about five hours. I don't know if this will work, but I'm looking, I'm looking to see if this will work. So we, we talk, we almost go into business together, but it doesn't end up working out. But it, in the process mm. of almost going into business together, I am now down there for like four or five days. While mm. I'm down there for four or five days, another company calls me. Uh, contacts us through the HPC website and says, hey, we're starting, we're turning this commercial mega gym, something that you don't really even see outside of the US. These three mm. story gyms that are, you know, uh, 6,000 square meters, 60 to mm. 100,000 square meters. So he had this huge, this huge mega gym and it was kind of failing, but a company had just bought it and was going to try to turn it into a privatized Olympic training center, of which there were two mm -hmm. at the time that were somewhat successful. And he offered me the opportunity to run it. Now, it wouldn't be my own business, but he said, hey, would you like to run it? So in the in this one business venture kind of fell through, but now I'm exploring this other one that is literally two or three miles, five kilometers from this other one. So I'm now down in North Carolina for... Uh, you know, it looks like two to three weeks at this point. I have one change of one or two changes of clothes, and uh, I'm living out of a hotel room, and uh, I'm all set to go in in this new one and basically just start a Olympic training center, effectively in this massive facility. Well, some guy from New Jersey, which is a uh, kind of bordering New York up up north, hmm. uh, he he buys he buys this Olympic training center esque facility, and. Uh, says, hey, I want to turn it into, I want to keep it as a health club. He pers it basically scraps that whole plan, but then it effect, they effectively bankrupt this facility uh, in the course wow. of about five months. Now, at this point, I've been down here for a month uh, in North Carolina, and I kind of like the area. I've liked what I've seen. I'm kind of invested in this area, and I start to look mm -hmm. at warehouses to do it on my own. And uh, so it takes... I basically stayed down here. I'm sleeping on the floor. I'm eating out of a single bowl with a single spoon and, um, <laughs> you know, finally bought a couple t-shirts, that kind of thing and making it work. And my family's still up in Ohio. Uh, at some point in time, I return and get them and move everybody down here. We get a facility that is basically just a, a warehouse, uh, three, you guys speak in square meters, right? So about 350 mm. square meters, uh, of space. Okay, yep. And it's, oh, oh no, sorry, 600 square meters of space, reasonably large. And, um, yeah. but it's a short term lease. So I'm just subletting from this company that doesn't want it anymore. And mm. it, because I, because I sublet this property, it was actually far cheaper than it should have been. Uh, I'm, we're actually right. in a facility that I, that I can't really afford, uh, but I ended up getting it and it's only 13 months in this one facility, which in retrospect, it seems absolutely crazy to set up shop in a facility that you only yeah. have for 13 months. All that moving. <laughs> right. So we get all this equipment of which I was super resourceful on. We were ordering direct from uh, overseas. In some cases, I was, you know, I th probably the best example of this is I ordered, I ordered track uh, about 120 meters of uh, track surface. And this is before the days of play and, um, you know, sport tracks and everything else. You can't mm. basically get get track surface readily available, certainly not online. And I, uh, I, I go on Alibaba. This is probably one of the better examples. I go on Alibaba yeah. and I say, hey, I'm, I'm building a track. Can I have some track, a sample of your track? And uh, yeah, they're, they're like, yeah, how much would you like? Uh, usually our samples are, uh, you know, five meters by five meters or something to that effect. And I was like, can I have uh, 120, 120 meters of track? <laughs> <laughs> so they sell it to me. At the, they sell it to me basically at shipping rate and uh, some, you know, a little bit more than uh, uh, what it would cost. If, to you, if you don't ask, you don't get. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so I get, I get a, this track that we then have for about 10 years until we move into our current facility. But we stay in that place. We fix it up real nice. It was basically Basically just a rundown warehouse. We make it look about as yeah. nice as it possibly could. That looks we move great. into our second, yeah. look into our second facility, which was uh, they base the the landlord did not do their due diligence on it because, uh, for context, we were making about at the time at month thirteen we were making about two thousand dollars a month, which is nothing, right? Mm -hmm. To to yeah. run a facility, and that's including 
not effectively not paying myself. The rent on this mm -hmm. new facility was somewhere about three or four times that much. So uh, I've always been a guy who is uh, somewhat fatally optimistic and being willing to take risks, but calculated risks yep. and try to make it work. And uh, so we, we got in this new facility. I had a couple months of free rent. I don't know if you do that in Australia, but basically yeah, we you, do as well. yep. and they, they, uh, you don't pay rent for a couple months. So I've moved into this facility kind of fingers crossed that in four months, I'd be able to quadruple our revenue and uh, be able to at least pay rent. Well, we didn't quite get there, but we did move into the new facility and I was, you know, could put put this extra cost on credit cards and things like that and put myself in a good bit of debt over the first couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, but we moved in the second facility in uh, about, that was 13 months after we first opened. We stayed in that facility for a eight years, eight or nine years. Mm -hmm. About five years or so, we expanded onto that facility, took over an adjacent space. So for context, that space, uh, we went from 60, 650 square meters to 1,000 square meters to 1,500 square meters um, after the expansion. Wow. Uh, so we stayed in there. We really maxed out that location as much as we possibly could in the um, about... Eight, eight or so years that we were in there, uh, we were kind of getting to the point where I was saying, well, we can't really generate more revenue within these walls. Um, mm. it, it, we're kind of restrict, restrained on that. How do I scale this business up? And uh, that's where I started to think of a handful of other things because it, you know, you realize, uh, as I'm sure anyone that's in private sector does at some point is, hey, that, you know, do you, if it's it's difficult to make as much money that is commensurate with how much you work, especially in yes. the early days, right? <laughs> so, you know, we love what we do, we're working hard, but it's, you have to find a way to scale your business. And in some cases, that needs to be outside of your walls. So I was looking mm -hmm. for all these different pathways and, you know, I was looking at licensing the business model. I was looking at uh, online training, our coaching education platform, taking it to a scalable model beyond just myself, and also looking at how do we expand the business itself that is within these walls. Um, so that was where we moved into our new facility. It is a built-to-suit uh, facility within a sports park. So we have two full FIFA size uh, football pitches directly outside of our door. We have the we have two ice hockey rinks about 100 meters away from us. We have a gigantic uh, vol uh, gymnastics gymnastics uh, training facility, the largest in the southeast, right across the road from us. We have uh, a volleyball center that has, I believe it's 12 indoor courts and two outdoor sand courts uh, another 100 meters away. So it's, it's a huge sporting facility. It's a real facility. precinct, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, and it was all kind of built for this model. And, um, you know, the, the interesting thing is when I first moved to North Carolina, I heard the news that this facility, this plan was in the works. And I kind of thought, oh, this, right. that's interesting. Uh, this will hopefully this uh, doesn't put us out of business or someone doesn't put a sports <laughs> performance place in here. Well, it actually took 10 years. It took 10 yeah. years for this kind of dream to actually be built because of a handful of governmental regulations. And it turns out that we were the facility that were, were put in there uh, or were able to move in there. So it's been really great. In the past uh, two years, we have expanded our team training uh, exponentially, really. So now we work with mm. some of the largest youth teams in the country, really. Uh, we have, there's a, ju there's a junior hurricanes team, which is ice hockey. The, they are the youth team associated with the Carolina Hurricanes NHL team. So we have all their youth teams that we train both in athletic lab walls, but also in a small training pad across the street that has a mini, miniature satellite location. And then we train right. the uh, youth soccer club. So the soccer club you mentioned in the introduction mm is enormous we we train the I, i'm the director for the pro teams that's the north carolina courage on the women's side where i work basically full-time 
and the NCFC, uh, which is North Carolina Football Club. Uh, I oversee them. I no longer work with them. Uh, but those two, those are the top of the pinnacle for the, that pro club. But underneath that, the youth side has 14,000 kids in it. 14,000. Wow. So that's the largest, I believe, in the world youth to pro pipeline. The women's side mm -hmm. is the first division. The men's side is uh, somewhere to be, somewhere around second division U.S., depending on the mm -hmm. year. We have a kind of screwy uh, division system in the U.S. So we, have a, we don't train anywhere near 14,000 kids. We only have about mm. uh, the, the very, very top. So no rec kids. We only have the academy level kids, but still that's about uh, less than, it's about 1% of the full club. Right. Mm. Uh, so that's a lot of kids. And mm. um, you know, we train them in, depending on the time of year, two or three different locations. We have a satellite location out in one of their major parks. We have our facility and then we have uh, just outside at our soccer fields. So this that was that kind of one of the things that I really, really busted my butt on during COVID because we were closed for six months. Mm. and. Uh, you know, we tried virtual thing, virtual training, and we had some loyal members, but our our revenue plummeted probably to mm. twenty percent, twenty to twenty to thirty percent of what it was prior to COVID for six that months. Sounds period. very familiar. <laughs> yeah, about just devastating, right? Uh, I, you know, the the numbers are devastating when you look at the fitness industry in mm. uh, in general, and um, mm. so I was like scrambling the whole time, and uh, work. Some of it was getting team contracts that wouldn't come to fruition for a year later. So right now mm. we're actually, we, uh, we ended 2021 by far our best year. Uh, at like the last six months of 2021 were, were by far out past pacing anything we'd ever have. And a big part of it was That's the great. team contract. Now we're, we're still digging yeah. ourselves out from this hole of being closed for six months and then kind of the six months that followed, but it, it, uh, we I use those that forced closure to really kind of push ahead a little bit. So right now, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I I personally, um, you know, at athletic or at athletic lab, not personally, but at athletic lab, our business model is pretty diverse. It always has been. Um, I've studied the field a little bit to to know that it's kind of difficult to make it work if you are ultra specialized. So we do have mm. general fitness training, adult fitness. We have youth training. We have professional training and we have private training. And each one of those are an important aspect of what we do and our revenue stream. And they ensure that, uh, you know, we never, we never have major droughts because say mm. in summertime, they, the high school kids are training in full, but uh, maybe, uh, you know, other people are, are uh, away. And then post New Year's, maybe the adult fitness population booms a little bit. But uh, and the and the kids are all in school and back playing sports. So we we have a pretty even revenue stream. And um, they all kind of ba balance each other out. And it allows us to have a facility that is probably, say, bigger, better than it otherwise would be if we were just, uh, say, adult fitness or just sport performance mm. you know we we can fill the middle of the day pretty well with our private training in our professional sector when that's you know as you know that's a that's a tricky thing to do in many cases for private sector dead time yeah right so we we're pretty active from about 6 a.m through about 8 p.m and from 4 30 p.m to about eight o'clock it is just a madhouse you know we may have uh we may train somewhere along the lines of 600 people during that time span in three different locations. Amazing. So, uh, it, it, you know, it, it, it has evolved over that time period, uh, took 12 years to kind of get these teams on board in some cases to, uh, get it to where it's scaling up a little bit. Um, so now really teams are a big part of what we do. Um, and then in terms of me personally, I, I have always loved coaching a little bit of everything, including the adult population, including the young LTAD type pathways. Right now though, I'm almost exclusively reserved for pros. I have three groups. Uh, they they mm -hmm. tend to show up on um, my Instagram feed some in, in uh, not necessarily representative uh, ratios, but I have my 
my pro soccer group, the uh, NCFC, or excuse me, the NC Courage. So they're about to start up again after an off season. They'll start up in uh, about two weeks time. And I work with them full time. I'm the performance director, do all this, manage the sports science, uh, GPS, heart rate, wellness monitoring, uh, all the reporting, the coding. I have uh, two assistants with, to help me with that. And uh, liaison for the medical team and the technical staff. And then run the business. Uh, and then in terms of my uh, training, I have uh, a basketball group. Uh, they're they're all away right now except for one mm -hmm. guy that is kind of a basketball slash celebrity uh, who who I work with on a regular basis. And then um, I have a uh, the track and field group, and they make a disproportionate number of the postings on Instagram just simply because uh, they're they're the only group that is mine. So uh, yeah. we have our own track and field group, uh, a track and field club at Athletic Lab. And uh, because it's not me working for another team, it is these guys kind of coming in and training as part of my club. I, I'm free to shoot videos and it's a little bit more for a little less formal. You know, I've seen I'm mm -hmm. with them training alone about 20 hours a week. So it's a little bit different dynamic than, say, the uh, pro setting of the of the soccer soccer yeah. club or uh you know, pri the, my basketball guys tend to be private training or small groups. So that's a little bit different. And then around this year, we'll have seasonal uh, NFL and NFL prospect and NFL offseason type of things for about two or three months. I believe in two weeks, we'll, we have a couple guys coming in to start training from the NFL uh, or for the NFL. So, uh, but my group, my, my day is uh, the past three years, two years, uh, has been trying to smash uh, about six hours of training into a four hour, four hour block. Everybody <laughs> seems to want the same, same time slots. Yeah. And uh, then my afternoons are largely spent uh, running the business and consulting and speaking and, you know, doing all the uh, kind of non-sexy stuff that, that uh, I enjoy doing, but it's not coaching, but I, but I still coach probably uh, on average, probably 25 hours a week. And then um, do all That's the fine. other stuff uh, as efficiently as I can. I'm perpetually behind on on emails and messaging and everything else. Uh, but uh, try to try to keep my head above water. That's incredible. Um, you have sparked so many. I already had what I thought was a lot of questions. You sparked so many more. What a story of serendipity! I, lo I love the North Carolina story. I think that's incredible, and, and how far you've taken it all. Um, I am too curious. What were your criteria? For, you, you identified North Carolina as one of your places that you want to start a business. Uh, what were the criteria you were looking at? So uh, I'm, I'm about twelve. Oh no! Almost thirteen years removed from this, uh, from when we opened, and fourteen years removed from when I was studying this. But basically, it looked something mm -hmm. to this effect: I, I recognized that we were a luxury service. So what I mean by mm -hmm. that is that uh, we are not essential, at least from the mm -hmm. way most people look at it. Right? Most people view essentials as, uh, sadly, you know, going to a restaurant or <laughs> something to that mm -hmm. regard. So, you know, we're we're almost in the vein of. Uh, you know, a, a luxury car or a vacation or for yeah. a lot of people. And um, very optional. Yeah, right. That's right. So we needed we needed a place where there was a, a high, not necessarily a high expensive area, but a high, uh, a low cost of living to potential mm -hmm. revenue. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, that was one thing. I wanted it to be relatively warm uh, because mm -hmm. much of what we would do would be training outside. So it had implications both for quality of life, but also for um, the, the training, right? So if you had, a, mm -hmm. had an outdoors, if you, if you could train outdoors, then you potentially didn't need a facility that was as big indoors because I never wanted my, yeah. my training to be compromised by the facility. So we had, we were, North Carolina is uh, warm enough year, year round. It's quite cold right now, mm -hmm. oddly enough, but it's uh, normally it is quite warm. I think our, our winter lows are somewhere on the order of, uh, I don't know, 13, 13 degrees uh, Celsius. So not, not freezing cold, but uh, uh, mm. 
warm enough, you can go outside and still train pretty well. It gets really hot in the summertime. And then um, I, I wanted people who were, I wanted a, a highly educated population. And the reason mm. for that is that the model that I was going to try to create was one of quality, meaning that I wasn't going to try to have people who were the kind of Instagram influencers you mentioned earlier in the talk where, mm. uh, you know, they're just good salesmen and uh, marketers and maybe have a weekend degree. I was going to try to create a sustainable uh, professional institution where people could make a living doing this and um, where I was going to hire people who invested in themselves, getting a college degrees, getting all the relevant certifications, continuing to do coaching, professional development, etc. So that takes takes money. And I needed people who would recognize that that was a value. Like if we mm -hmm. if we go to uh, a medical doctor, we look for the most qualified medical doctor. If we go to, you know, a lawyer, we're going to look at where they went to school and maybe what journals or where they have where they have worked previously. But in our field, mm -hmm. sadly enough, if you go to the local gym, a lot of times it it come you make your trainer selection based off of what that person looks like or um, yeah. maybe how many Instagram followers they have. And, you know, a lot of that is just completely bogus, really. So our people obviously need to look the part. I think that's important. But mm. I was looking for the muscle up here rather than, say, the muscle mm. uh, on your body. So I wanted people who were going to treat this as a profession, a profession, not fly by night, not train in exchange for a free membership, et cetera. And to be able to do that, I needed to have a population of people potential clients who would recognize the value of education and uh, experience. So typic, generally speaking, people who are educated recognize that education is a value. Mm. So uh, this is the most educated area in the entire United States. Uh, right. the, the triangle, which is where we are in North Carolina, it's called the triangle because it's made up of, uh, it's actually made up of three cities or four cities, but originally three so it's called the triangle because of chapel hill which is where unc mm -hmm. is uh, uh durham which is where duke is these are schools which many international listeners may know and then uh raleigh which is actually the biggest of the cities and that's where nc state is so these are all massive universities mm -hmm. uh, they all have somewhere on the order of 25 to thirty-five thousand students and they're all very very highly regarded um and the, the the these three have made this a just a tremendous educational hub in the United States. Uh, you know, we have companies like IBM and SAS that are just that are centered here. So just a tremendously mm -hmm. educated, I think, 30% uh, of the adult population in Cary, which is where we're located, is uh, has a postgraduate degree. So not just a bachelor's degree, but a postgraduate Post degree. Postgrad. Yeah, That's so it's amazing. you know it's if you if you walk around and you have a master's, you're really nothing special. Even like a lot of people have doctorates around here. It's kind of unusual. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, yeah. uh, the uh, we had educated population, and that would kind of converge or overlap with being a more affluent or have a higher disposable income, yeah. and then have a good sporting scene. So here we've got these three universities. We've got a couple pro sports teams locally. Um, I actually thought moving to North Carolina that our primary sport was going to be basketball as a business model, mm -hmm. but it really took about 10 years for that. This area, I didn't realize at the time when I first moved down here is, is a massive soccer area. So, uh, it ended up working out, but, uh, that wasn't what I had originally planned. I was not a kind of soccer guy, uh, soccer football guy, but it was more, uh, you know, I was more of a track and field basketball guy. It took many years for, for me to even really start working again in basketball. And mm. um, then the other thing that, that uh, I was kind of cognizant of even 14 years ago and uh, am very thankful for now is that it, we were a large enough city where people could come in easily uh, and I could leave and return easily. So, you know, I had mm. been to many, many cities where the airport is an hour away, um, or it's di just difficult to get into and out of. You need a lot of connections to get to that city. And, uh, you know, 14 years ago, I, I was doing some consulting and speaking for a couple different national governing bodies, all domestic. 
And uh, I was flying quite a bit. And I recognized that, hey, this is, if I'm going to be gone all the time away from my family, that I can't waste extra time commuting to the airport or extra time stuck in layover airports. And then also, if we were going to have athletes that were going to come in to train with us, that that it needed to be a place that was easy enough to get to. Well, uh, we, we do have quite a few athletes that we are a destination location. In fact, all of the track and field group moved here. They were not from here, you know, so we have, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting and humbling and it's, uh, it it makes me realize that we have to uh, do a good job with them because they all move here from all over the U S there's no one here, even from the state of North Carolina. Uh, you know, they're moving from all over. We have, we had just had a guy come in on Monday who's from the UK. So, um, you know, these guys, these are guys who are uprooting their lives to, to kind of do this. And, uh, the, and then for 13 years later, uh, or 10 years later, after we opened, um, you know, I was traveling all the time. And in 2019, I, I kind of left this part out when I talked about the third facility, our new, our current facility is even this facility. I was biting off more than I could chew. Um, mm. you know, I, the down payment was the down security deposit for this location was more than we had in the bank account. Um, so, wow. but I, again, made it happen, but the, uh, the way that I did that was I, in the way that I did that and, uh, afforded all of the upfit of a, of a brand new built to suit facility, including flooring expenses and, new equipment and everything else was I, in 2019, I just whored myself out. So, <laughs> uh, it's a very blunt way of putting it. But I was, I was gone probably 35 weeks of weekends of the year in, um, 2019. Wow. And, uh, you know, I think, I think I accumulated somewhere on the order of about 200,000 flight miles and was just wow. gone all the time. It was, it's a little bit of a blur to me, uh, 2019, but we're able to, to crunch the numbers and make it work and able to afford, uh, everything of getting in this facility and, uh, everything else. Uh, and, but if I had not, uh, if I had not been in this area, that wouldn't have been possible. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I famously will famously will arrive to an airport 25 minutes before my flight departs. You know, it's, uh, I'm one of those guys and I do it all the time. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, pre COVID or post COVID, it's a little bit different, obviously, but yeah, I, yeah. um, you know, I've got all of the travel assurances and I can speed through lines and I know how to pack and I know which line I have priority access here and there and everything else, but I'm, I'm not going to waste any of my life in an airport if I don't have to. Um, so the, uh, That's amazing. you know, I, I, I will leave, I will leave work and head, head to the airport uh, you know, and be in the airport in 10 minutes. So, and be on the airplane yep. in 25 minutes after that. So these kinds of things, I think kind of add up, especially if you were doing like what I was doing in 2017 through 19 of just traveling once or twice a month, um, mm. they add up to kind of allowing you to have a little bit of normalcy of life. And, um, so it was kind of this, uh, this, this really nice, mix of things that this area worked and in retrospect like in now 10 even like two three years after i had moved here this area has just been on every single list uh in business magazines of best areas to start a business and best areas to uh have high quality of life so my preliminary research was uh fruitful because that was kind of what i was seeing the cost of living was low relative to the quality of life we're what what I would call a poor man's California here. We have beautiful beaches about two hours away, and we have skiable mountains about three hours away. So, um, you know, and, and none of the at a at a fraction of the cost of California. So, um, you know, I'm and we're centralized location. It, I've really liked being here. I can see myself maybe moving at some point and taking on another team job, but uh, I this will be home base. That actually, That's I, I left out on left oh. out on one thing is that uh, in 2012 through 14, I actually had moved to Vancouver, Canada, ran the business from from afar. So Vancouver, Canada is the yeah obviously different country, mm. but the exact opposite side of North America. 
and uh, worked full time with the Vancouver Whitecaps of the MLS, um, which was so a the, move I really appreciated. But it was that, yeah, but it was uh, it was on that one. Um, I, I I'm very curious. Um, we at Corvange we we've, we've developed a, a, a new um, sort of avenue of the business called a metric VBT. And part of my challenge is I've been stepping back a little from Core Advantage itself. So I've appointed uh, one of our coaches as, as a head of athletic development. Another one is running our schools program. And so my challenge is for the first time in my 20 plus years is stepping back and letting them run the show and, and you know, focusing more on this new venture. I'm really curious. It's, it sounds um, amazing. And for, so for me, being home for a week or two and not going into the office seems like a big deal. Uh, but to move to the other side of, of, you know, to move so far north and run it for two years, uh, how did you go about that? And um, I'm very curious about the ability to, to empower your team to successfully run the business while you're away. It was very tricky, you know, and I, I'm not one, I wasn't one to naturally let go. Um, you know, at the time there weren't, things as uh, easily accessible as as zoom or anything else but I was I was probably hovering a lot a lot of the time so I would I would force mm. force uh, at least this, this is a kind of a crazy one but I would force at least 100 pictures to be taken every week uh, during the <laughs> during the context of classes yeah <laughs> and uh, you know <laughs> under the guise of let's put this on social media but um, so we would put it on social media, upload it to Facebook and everything yep. else like that. But, um, inevitably what would happen is be, I, I would effectively coach the coaches or look at the quality of the facility maintenance or, Hey, why are we doing yep. this? And, um, you know, kind of, uh, making sh almost if, if it were possible to micromanage from, uh, you know, 4,000 kilometers away, I was kind of doing that at least initially. And, yep. uh, so really I've, the most I've been able to step away is probably the last, uh, three years. So now I work a, a normal week. I really like what I do. So I, I have always found it hard to kind of pull away, which is a little unfair for my family. Uh, but I, last couple of years, I've, I have been able to go home kind of when I want, you know, I go home at, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, 5 p.m. a lot of days or I will uh, I, I start at eight o'clock. So a kind of a normal day. And then the some days I'll go home at, you know, go watch my daughter's basketball game at, at three o'clock or something like that. And uh, it, it, I don't have to work on the weekends. I've, I've got a team around me that I can trust. And now I have uh, I've created a, a system where there are other delegators, uh, other people responsible for things than myself. So I'm not, I, mm. I am the one that sits at 30,000 feet, but I'm not the one that has to make every single decision uh, or c control all aspects of quality. So the, I now have someone where, you know, last summer I almost took, there were two jobs that came up. I almost took them and um, I would have felt comfortable leaving because I've put a I've put a, a hierarchy in place that the second in charge and the third and third in rank could take over the facility if they needed to. There'd of course be some growing pains, yep. um, but it, it the thing that is that is difficult that I really had to convince myself of or or learn was that uh, you only have so many hours in the day and you you simply just can't add to that there, as much as you might want to. And you have to scale back and step back and say, uh, although no one might do the work as well as yourself, at least initially, that's that's always the concern if you were the owner, right? Mm. No one will yep. no one will love my baby as much as I do. No one will do it to the extent that I do. Um, that you can never scale that way. So you need to find mm. surround yourself with excellent human beings who ideally are also experts in what they do and then empower them to be able to do these things without the fear of 
any repercussions if they screw up the first couple times. You know, we hold them accountable, but mm. give them the give them the power to be able to make decisions on the, their own. And what I am really trying to do, and I've had this conversation with a couple of my staff, is really, although I'm the owner of Athletic Lab, I want each of my staff members to be mini entrepreneurs, uh, so mm. that they can take the take one aspect of the business that they're in control of. And they can grow that, and they can be rewarded for that growth. And in some some cases, I've even, uh, you know, they're they're paid more because of a good job. You know, like they're they're actually incentivized beyond say just their standard salary. They I I, I make sure that they're they know that they're appreciated. Um, so a lot of it just comes down to like I've got to step back and say, hey, it might take some time for me to create a system where these individuals can do what I want to the quality they want and to uh, go through this learning process. But now we're so systematized that uh, I feel like I could leave again if needed and the system is in place. And that's what I always wanted. Uh, I, I never mm. wanted this to be the Mike Young show. I always wanted it to be Athletic Lab, something that was kind of stood for best practices period rather than anything about me individually. And, um, mm. you know, but at the same time, it, it's difficult to kind of look at it and say, oh, this, can this guy do it like like I can do it? Uh, will this guy care as much as I care? And, um, you know, even even when the answer is is no, and that may very well be the case, you still have to recognize that is the drop off worth you trying to control everything? You know, can you get more and done? And killing yourself in the process. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean delegation has really been been critical so it, it's painful yeah. sometimes to you know write the write the processes out that will allow for long-term sustainable progress um, and I don't necessarily mean this nec- write it actually write it or type it out but to create to create these system flows mm. where mm. if if someone leaves this other person knows how to do it if uh, yeah you know, every, I'd like to say that we're all, all the whole staff, we're our largest as we've ever been at 16 right now. Um, mm-hmm. We are, we're, we're all cogs, cogs in this massive yep. system. Um, but everybody's special, right? So everybody's special, but we're yep. all cogs. And what I mean by that is that we, if, if someone was to leave, you could be replaced, including myself. Mm-hmm. Um and that doesn't speak anything that doesn't mean any detriment to me or to to anyone individually it just means that this has grown to the point where it is not about any one individual um and it's really a lot of that has been empowering the staff to be able to treat their domains as small entrepreneurs you know where they have my yep. support to pursue this how they want and I'm not going to uh, micromanage. And, and really, uh, mm. to, to kind of bring some of this discussion full circle, uh, when we started and I said, hey, one of the things I really learned at LSU was how, does it, how do they have such sustainable success? And the guy at the top was a coach named Pat Henry who's subsequently gone on to another university and had a similar run of championships at this other university. So he's clearly got a system. And the, mm. the thing that I noticed right away was that this guy who was a track and field coach, if he wasn't a track and field coach, he would be running a Fortune 500 company. He, he was willing to hire the smartest people and let them do their thing. And not as long as they did their, what they were supposed to do, he was hands off. He would support them. It, it could mean that the diff, there were different training philosophies, but he was going to bring in the best people. And it was kind of a situation where, you know, you hear this quote of um, that, I, that I kind of think to myself all the time is if, if you're always the smartest guy in the room, you're in the wrong room. You know, you got to surround yourself with people who are <laughs> like my favorite quote. Yeah, you got to surround yourself with people who are like going to push your limits or open new open new doors and ideas to you and. Um, so we've got this expert staff now, I think, and I'm really confident in them and I feel like I can, you know, hand off things and if, if they make mistakes, I can trust them and they're going to do the best thing. And, um, I'm not going to feel like I need to, you know, jump down their throat and we can kind of make democratic 
uh, decisions. It's it's kind of a nice place that we've been in for. Uh, it's really it's really grown over the past three years. It started before that, but in the past three years, it's really been a nice setup that's allowed me more freedom to pursue other things. And I love your term, open source meritocracy. The idea that it's, everyone's you know contributing to the code of the overall um, you know computer program or, or system. Yeah. Um, ha- the, int- the intriguing question is always where the line is in terms of, of when you're doing something like that, because you want to foster that individual uh, ingenuity from your people, but also you need to have a coherent philosophical approach. You know, you can't be having different, you know, can't be having one person doing CrossFit stuff while other, someone else is yeah. doing strict Olympic lifting while someone else is doing some, you know, hit stuff. It's, there's got to be a coherence to it. How do you um, create an environment where you have that open source meritocracy, but that coherence? So to be honest, a lot of it starts with our on-site mentorship program. So we have all told in our 13 years, I believe we've had just north of um, 40 coaches. So we've had about 37-ish coaches uh, in in four, 13 years. Um, and all but one of those, no, all but two of those coaches have gone through our mentorship program. So Mm. that mentorship program is kind of like an internship program, but what that allows us to do is kind of handpick individuals that we feel fits our system. And from the very first day, this is actually in the orientation of that mentorship program. I stand up and I say, you have the opportunity from day one to immediately contribute to this open source meritocracy. Uh, And it has happened. We have had interns that will come in and say, hey, you should move this piece of equipment here, or you should think about having this kind of class workflow. And, you know, 90% of the time, it's not, it doesn't meet the standard. Uh, In fact, within Mm. their first two weeks, they have multiple assignments that are actually asking them to critique us. So you have an intern that's walking wow, in the door and they're great. critiquing us. They're telling us, what, I love you know, that. What, are you seeing anything that is odd? Are you seeing what's wrong with the facility? Everything like this. And um, so right from the get-go, we're, I say we're open source meritocracy that you can contribute to immediately. And the one thing that I want you to get out of this mentorship, even if you don't want, even if you don't like our training philosophy, is that you are... Uh, absurdly open-minded, you will consider everything, but you were ridiculously Mm. critical-minded. So what this allows Mm. you to do is that you will consider, you will have strongly held beliefs, but you will consider and be open to changing them at all, at all costs. So, but you have to be critical-minded. And what the, the fascinating part about this is, is that if you find people who are uh, have strongly held beliefs, but are open-minded to, to consider anything alternative, even if it is in, in, uh, flies in the face of their own beliefs, what you find here is that there is a convergence, right? Because there, it, you're not all going to be the same, but you're all going to follow at least what is close to the known best practice. So there might be people that say, hey, I prefer the front squat to the back squat, or I prefer to do unilateral over bilateral, but there's not going to be someone that says, hey, I think you should run a two minute anaerobic glycolytic, you know, repetitions to develop speed. It's just not going to happen. We're all going to, the differences between our coaches is going to be a matter, almost a stylistic difference. Our, our cues, our hmm. uh, teaching progressions, our training philosophies are all going to be very, very similar. You know, I, I think I've heard, uh, uh, I'm not, actually, I'm not sure where I got this, so I don't want to misquote this, but this is something that I think of, especially as I've hmm. kind of gotten a little bit older and have been in this field for long enough, is that, um, and, and, you know, you go back to these Instagram posts and you think, man, there's uh there's a lot of people that would, would look, look on people that do just simple, basic, fundamental training and say, oh, that guy's old school, right? You, you talk about guys like, say, 
a Mike Boyle mm-hmm. or a Dan Baker or something like this. You know, guys that are just going to do basic mm-hmm. strength work and sprint work and, you know, stuff like this. And you say, oh, those guys are old school. And, uh, you know, inevitably, these are guys who are veterans in the field, of which I'm kind of like slowly creeping up on myself. And uh, mm-hmm. you're like, well, these are these guys really old school or have they been in the game long enough that they see what works and what doesn't work? And by that point in time, mm-hmm. if you've been in this game long enough, there's there starts to become a convergence, right? Like you, you've you tested all these crazy things that these Instagram influencers are doing. And at the end of the day, after many years of experience, you, you start to throw out the junk. And you all start to come around mm-hmm. to roughly this same way of doing things. And it's not because you're old school. It's not because... Uh, you know, you're hyperbolic or dog dogmatic or anything like that. It's because there is a best practice and that best practice does allow there, for there a, a decent way. bit of yeah. variance, but, it, but it's not as if the bandwidth of best practice is so wide that it permits everything in there. So I think that's where we follow. That's where mm. we fa- fall is that we are um, evidence-based field proven. That's our gold standard. We don't always reach that. But, you know, we will say we're going to do the very best possible thing that we can do until we know that there's something better to do. Um, And I think if you think Mm. of it like that, this model is always evolving and it it leaves room for some stylistic differences or, you know, there's obviously cases of the, the... I guess the unilateral bilateral, you could, I, you could make a devil's advocate case for either mm. one, Olympic lift, don't Olympic lift, that kind of thing. Those still fit within best practice models, right? Those are, those are nuance. But if you're saying, Hey, I'd like to develop power by, I don't know, aqua jogging, that doesn't fit in the model. There's nothing wrong with <laughs> aqua jogging, yeah. but it's, we know that doesn't fit the it's model or power. trampoline jumping, something like yeah. that. So there, there are a lot of different options um, we, we tend to operate where, where we feel like it's a, a, a bandwidth of best practice and, you know, coaches can have their differences, but you're going to find that, um, we expedite the, I expedite these young coaches becoming old coaches and following old school methods pretty yeah. quickly because, uh, you know, they, they start to see what works and, um, so mm-hmm. it's a, it's a convergence really is what, what ends up happening. Um, that's that's awesome and it's, it's the that idea of you know in the beginner's mind there are many ways in the expert's mind uh there are a few it's it's interesting because i when yeah. i'm watching your content uh i'll have seen you'll uh, i'll seen a, a really clever execution of a thing where i'm like oh that's exactly how i i know i want to get there but you found a slightly different way to get there and often better um but it's still fundamentally the same uh, the same destination to identify sure yeah an interesting thing that i uh, an interesting thing that I'm um, starting to see more and more is uh, the the bias of Instagram towards the novel and the sexy, and that's right um, towards this side, and particularly the controversial. So I'm having to have discussions with people that there are people genuinely saying, "Oh, exercise technique doesn't matter that much anymore. Just just move the weight. You'll you'll be right. Like you don't fuss so much about technical stuff." <laughs> And it's like it's so it's so hard to argue against it because it's so it's like arguing with a a, a column of smoke wrestling with a column of smoke. Uh, how do you talk to people around that kind of stuff? Because it's definitely it's gaining more and more. This is undertow of just get a stimulus in. It doesn't really matter how. How do you argue against that? What do you and what do you think about that thing? Yeah, I mean, it's really disappointing. It it kind of, I'm not, this is actually is a little bit of a motivation for me. So I'm not one that uh, loves to post for likes or anything like that, or even like be on social media is it's not like as innate love of social media myself. But I think to myself, like, oh, man, if, uh, if people don't put out solid content, uh, or at least what I I guess, biasly believe is solid content, educational content, science-based, evidence, evidence-based, field proven, then, then all you see is that is the kind of sexy novel, um, controversial stuff. So 
my when I the thing that motivates me to post is actually a, a small that I'm making a small dent in the universe or balancing out these mm. and offering an alternative viewpoint. Um, it is really, really difficult, and I don't know. Sadly, I'm not sure how we move away from it. Um, I, I, it's hard to see that it, short of say, um, computer modeling and artificial intelligence interventions, how they're that they could conceivably just prove that some of the nonsense is just wrong. Like, you know, Instagram, the most <laughs> liked Instagram posts in our field are effectively just exercises, right? They're standalone novel exercises. Yep. There's, and if you, if you include a half naked woman in those exercise videos, then it's a tenfold in terms of its reach. And mm -hmm. um, it's almost just disingenuous. You don't really see that there's a lack of expertise, like true expertise, too many places outside of our field. Like, you know, you don't see it in, mm. in legal, in the legal field. You don't see it in, um, you know, uh, computer, computer science or anything else. You know, it's just basically, well, yeah. you know, um, <laughs> my wife's an aerospace engineer and she walked past my computer the other day and there was, I was watching an Instagram thing and there was a guy with his shirt off telling about why you should do a thing. And she's like, why has he got his shirt off? I'm like, it's just our industry. People often have to have their shirt off for people to believe. And it's just like, <laughs> you guys are crazy. <laughs> yeah. It was just, and it was just one of those moments where I just had this, I had this sudden realization of this is a weird little universe we live in where to prove how clever I am in a space, I have to not be wearing a shirt. <laughs> like that's, it is, that's it is really, uh, it's almost sad, right? Because, uh, you know, the way I think about it is that a lot of those individuals that are, they, they don't look that way because of what they're doing. They're still in what I would call the mm. free trial period of health, wellness, and fitness. You know, if you're if you're 20 years old, <laughs> <That's a> great... <laughs> if you're 20 years old and you don't look pretty fit, you've actually done something really wrong. It's not like you've done something great. You've done something really wrong if you don't look healthy and fit. So pretty these good. guys have yeah. just done something okay. And they're probably genetically well, you know, endowed in some capacity, whether that is low body fat mm. or, um, you know, big breasts or big biceps for guys or whatever. And it, we'll, let's see what they look like when they are 40 years old, 50 years old. Does, the, does their mm. knowledge actually produce after the free trial? And, um, mm. you know, it's just, uh, it's <laughs> sad to get term. around I'm gonna, that. I'm going to steal that liberally. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's it is really it's really sad yeah. how do you get around that um, you know i think if you look at the people that look at look for the sustainable success i think is what you have to look for and these the, mm. the fly-by-night internet mm. ones are it's tough to what's what's sexy is oftentimes not it's almost inversely related to effectiveness sexy interesting novel controversial yeah for sure Mm, I couldn't couldn't agree more. Now you've been so generous with your time, but, I, but I, I and I've I've got a whole bunch of other questions I want to ask, but I'll, I'll keep it to just a couple if you don't mind. Have, have you got time for a couple of questions on soccer? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So I'm fascinated by your soccer success flowing out of the high speed track and field work. Um, my in a, so soccer in Australia at least is a sport where. They desperately need S and C, but they don't know they need it. Uh, it's there's still this cultural thing where they just want they just want to play. Um, I think that's uh, I'd love worldwide. to hear your yeah. It's, I'd love to hear how you've gone about being such a successful uh, soccer high performance manager, and also a few of the key blocks in terms of injury prevention. You know, how do you how do you think about soccer? I suppose is what I want to know. So I've really lucked out in soccer. Uh, I, I kind of left this bit of the story out, but my, I had my, up until about 30 years old, my only exposure to soccer was that my mom, who was uh, English, tried to get me to play soccer when I was a, a young, young child, maybe six years old. Uh, and uh, she forced me to play it, and I, I apparently hated it so much that – I didn't even move on the field. I just stood there while all the, the play is going on around me. <laughs> that, that quickly ended. 
And then I open Athletic Lab, and in the first facility, the, the warehouse one, that was uh, 650 square meters, I had one of my elite track and field athletes. Uh, he went around the, the area, and he just started putting on flyers on people's cars, which is completely illegal, but he was putting on these flyers, and it was what well, in the U.S. we would call guerrilla marketing. And um, yeah. One of the flyers that he happened to put on someone's car, or the, uh, one of the individuals, was the manager of the North Carolina, what eventually became the North Carolina Football Club. So this guy said, hey, we have just gotten rid of our, our performance manager, at the time just a strength coach, not really even a performance manager, and um, would you like to do it? Uh, we don't have any budget, but would you like to do it? Well, you don't have any budget, I don't have any clients, uh, so this maybe can work. Uh, so we did it in exchange mm. for, for one year for basically just the opportunity to work with uh, a professional team and professional athletes. And, you know, the interesting thing is at the time, I, my science background is in exercise physiology as an undergraduate degree and, a, mm. and as a minor for my Ph.D., and then my mm -hmm. Ph.D. as a major in biomechanics. Um, so I, I'm pretty well steeped in like physiology and, uh, you know, I had instructed uh, the physiology and sports science sections and the endurance sections for USA track and field. So I, I very well understood motor development and physiology and training theory for, for energy systems and metabolic conditioning and everything. Uh, so I got these soccer guys coming in in their off season and I just trained the hell out of these guys. So it was just in retrospect is like, I don't know why they didn't fire me, but the, 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 uh, I, I trained these guys so hard and they went from being like this, this horrendous team, uh, second division USL's horrendous team to, they won the league two years in a row. And uh, we wow. had the highest goal scoring team in North America for, for two years in a row. And uh, off the back of that, like we were just physically dominant. We were running people out of the park. We were faster. We were more enduring. And off the back of that, I got three uh, offers from MLS teams and ended up taking the Vancouver one. And um, so by this point in time, I'm now kind of like ingrained in the sport. You know, if year one, I if you would have asked me how many guys were on the pitch at the same time, I would have said, I have no idea. Like I was that far removed from the sport. I, I wouldn't have, I, I would have known there was a goalkeeper and maybe a forward, but I don't know the other positions or what they do or what have you. Mm. I really was so far removed from the sport. I was a basketball track and field guy as a, as a youth athlete. So fast forward, I basically just full blast, uh, you know, self learn on the sport as much as I can. And, um, it, it, a lot of that just sits on the back of the sport science and the, and the training theory. And I'm a kind of a strong believer that my background in track and field has really given me the template for other sports. So I've worked in a variety of different sports, mm -hmm. uh, at, at a pretty high level, uh, soccer, basketball, American football, I've even trained some combat sport athletes. And I, you know, I've, I think I have five, uh, national level, five national, uh, qualifying athletes and that I have personally coached. I'm not like there's S and C coach, but in mm. skeleton, bobsleigh, weightlifting, uh, track and field. Um, and, and in track and field, I have six event event groups. So, um, you know, you're if you have this science background and you have you understand how to develop someone in their their physical capacities, it really lends itself well to being a template for all other activities. Uh, you know, I think mm -hmm. sometimes people people uh, rustle at this, but uh, you know when they come to a S and C coach and they say, Hey, can you help us out? Uh, or are you, can you work with a soccer team? Can you work with a rugby team? Can you work with uh, basketball? Are you just a track guy? And say, well, no, I'm not just a track guy. Does, does your sport require you to run fast uh, or jump high or jump far or throw far or sustain activity for an extended period of time? Because if it does, that's the sport that I come from. Those are a part of your sport. But that is my mm -hmm. original sport. Uh, and in fact, 
to be able to be thing. successful in this sport, it it ha- it is brutally honest, right? If I'm not good at making someone strong, they're not going to be successful as a weightlifter. If I'm not good at making someone fast, yep. they're not going to be good at uh, a track as a track and field athlete. So it really uh, it weeds out. You can't be an Instagram influencer style coach and be a, a successful uh, track and track and field or weightlifting coach or cycling coach or yeah. rowing coach or swimming coach because the the sports are too brutally honest. They they are quantitatively mm-hmm. assessed performance sports. They will weed out the charlatans really quickly. So if you're if you're a charlatan who just is going to throw up some voodoo magic that does well on YouTube and Instagram, you'll be found out really quickly when your athletes don't produce. Um, so I've, I've gotten buy-in really quickly. I've never, I've worked for, uh, five soccer managers and they've all, they've all brought me in. So except for one that and the one that didn't bring me in. Yeah. yeah. The one that didn't bring me in was hesitant at first, but then, um, he became like our, my, my probably biggest advocate very, very, uh, would That's allow me right. to do anything I wanted carte blanche. It took a year or two, but, uh, mm-hmm. it took a year, year and a half. But at that point in time, we became very, very successful. And so I haven't had the struggle of that. I hear many younger coaches have where, Oh, the, the coach doesn't want us to lift or what have you, or he doesn't want us to sprint. I haven't fully dealt with that to the same extent that some coaches have because I've, I've been brought in and many times just given carte blanche to do what I want to do. But, uh, you know, it, 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 I think a lot of the success has kind of come on the background of, on the back of understanding the sports science, the physiology, and being from sports, uh, track and field, um, mm. and uh, weightlifting, where performance is just brutally honest. You just you just can't get around it. So things like tracking GPS, load monitoring, heart rate, it's just – it's it's just the same physiology that is just par for the course in in other sports you know it's like in these other sport and in it's almost like mind boggling to think of uh the chaos of team sports when compared to the control mm-hmm. over those variables that you have in these individual sports uh, that was actually the hardest part for me was like recognizing that you can't have these nice clean high low days and neuromuscular days mm-hmm. and everything else or you have to just look at load. did you come you into it thinking that because it's often a battle between a young coach and old like the young coaches and sports coaches in team sports i've experienced in, in basketball in the past where they'll want a 52-week plan with everything periodized and my approach is i said well no like the sport is going to be chaotic you're going to miss opportunity you're going to miss opportunities to push if it's a designated easy day and the reverse is going to happen as well you really need that sort of agile opportunistic periodization where you just make hay while the sun shines. Right. Uh, was, was that a transition for you or did you come to that early as well? It was a little bit of a transition. Um, I, I am a quick learner. So, um, you know, I, I'm very willing to be wrong and very quick to recognize <laughs> yeah. my mistakes and faults. Uh, and, and I'm like, spend a lot of time making, you know, not intentionally making mistakes, but I, will rarely make the same mistake twice. So you, mm. I quickly learned that the overarching philosophy of training does stays the same, but there are nuances similar to what we talked about with the systems-based approach of my business, where you just have to learn the nuances of that sport. Um, in team sports, especially in, in soccer, where you're – you know, you can play as many as 50 times in a year. You have to be super agile and you have, you have a varying degrees mm. of, um, uh, training load within the same group. You know, if I send, if I have 10 sprinters and they all do the same sprint workout, they pretty much all had very similar training load, but you put 10 players out on the mm. soccer pitch and the difference between the high and the low might be 50% in a given metric. So, mm. Uh, you know, this is where monitoring, monitoring and load management becomes more important in team sports because you, you're not controlling all the variables like you would on an individual sport. Mm. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Mike, um, 
Thank you so much for your generosity with your time and for sharing all of your insights. Uh, I will work desperately to get you perhaps uh, in the second half of the year back on because uh, I didn't get to. I want to talk to you about a whole bunch of other things, including sports technology, uh, cultural stuff. There's, there's a whole bunch of things I'd love to pick your brain on. Sure, glad um, to help. But thank you so much. Thanks for coming on the show. Uh, in the show notes, we'll share the links to Athletic Lab. We'll share your social uh, links. And if I could, if I could make a request to our audience, there's a thing that happens on Instagram where you kind of just scroll through and you look at a thing and you go, "Oh, that looks." You kind of speed read it. That looks clever, and then you flick on. Uh, I read every one of Mike's posts twice because they're all, there's always gold in them. Uh, do the same and you'll be doing yourself a favor. I think uh, it's his stuff is really, really good to follow and you'll you'll learn a great deal. I appreciate that. I, I th- thank right. you a lot for the invite. I, it's a great time. Thanks, Durham. Okay, hope you enjoyed that episode. You'll find all the relevant show notes over at coreadvantage.com.au. Uh, also on the website, you can find more information about our uh, athletic development services, education, uh, short courses, and uh, everything else we're up to. So that's coreadvantage.com.au. Cheers, guys. See ya.